This is my second video on angular kinematics. If you haven't seen the first one on some preliminary considerations, I highly recommend you go back and look at it. But now, let's get into kinematic variables. Remember that our first kinematic variable was position. And that is simply your location within a frame of reference. In one dimension, that position is simply going to be located along an axis, which is designated by your direction. And I stated that that can either be in the positive direction or in the negative direction, but it was still going to be located along that one particular axis. In two dimensions, we talked about needing one coordinate for each dimension because you will have a location in each dimension. And representing that position as being a location along each axis, one for the x dimension and then one for the y dimension, and we designate that position as being a location in both dimensions simultaneously. So now let's talk about an angular position. First, I should mention that all of the angular quantities are going to be denoted with a Greek letter. So in this case, our Greek letter for angular position is going to be the Greek letter theta. And our angular position is simply going to be our orientation within a frame of reference. This here represents a room. And you can see in one case, I have a door a that's opening up into the room and another door B that's opening out or away from the room. And if you note that our frame of reference, which you see here in the center, shows that counterclockwise rotations are positive, and that means clockwise rotations are negative, you can see the orientation of A would be a positive number and the orientation of B would be a negative number if we were to assume that the closed door position was that neutral or zero position. Now let's talk about displacement. Recall that displacement is simply going to be a change in position. So if you were located, let's say at the origin and you displaced to the right, then you would have a positive displacement or displacement to the right. We could also be moving to the left and if we move to the left, we would have a negative displacement. And remember that the positive displacement is not greater than a negative displacement. It's not like your bank account. It simply means that it's going to be a displacement in the opposite direction. So in this case, if A displaced 10 meters to the right and B displaced 10 meters to the left, that does not mean that A had a greater displacement than B. It simply meant that A had a displacement that was in the opposite direction. Next, let's go ahead and let's think about our displacement in two dimensions. So now we're moving not only in an X dimension, but also in a Y dimension. And we said that just like denoting the position, we need to denote the displacement using two coordinates, one coordinate for each dimension. And we can say that we have an arrow that's going to go from the origin, let's say, to our particular position. And then again, we would drop a line down to the x-axis and drop a line across to the y-axis and denote that final position as having both an x and a y coordinate. And that y coordinate and the x coordinate would be equivalent to drawing one from the origin along those particular axes. Well, for our angular displacement, we are simply going to say that that's going to be a change in our orientation within our frame of reference. So again, let's denote that positive x-axis as being an orientation angle of zero. Now I can make a displacement, in this case I am rotating within that frame of reference, to a new orientation. And we'll call that theta prime. So the differences in the orientations between theta and theta prime will be denoted in this case by a counterclockwise arrow. And that curved arrow is going to represent that angular quantity. So curved arrows, angular quantities, Greek letters, also angular quantities. And then if I were to go ahead and I were to displace again, let's say to another orientation, in which case we'll call that theta double prime, and again, we can see that I had a displacement. 
in this case, going in that counterclockwise direction from theta prime to theta double prime. And we'll denote this with a series of rotations. So you can see the representation for the first rotation on the left and a depiction for the second rotation on the right. Mathematically speaking, we said that our linear displacement was simply going to be a change in position. So we would say P prime minus P. In two dimensions, recall that we have to have a displacement in each dimension. So we have our X dimension and our Y dimension, and we are going to subtract the X's from the X's, and we're going to subtract the Y's from the Y's in order to get our differences in the X and in the Y dimensions. And if we wanted to know what that resultant displacement was, we would take the square root of the sum of the squares. And then we would also use the arctan function in order to find what that resultant angle was going to be. Angular displacement conceptually is going to be the same thing. We would simply say that our angular displacement is going to be our final orientation or our final angle minus our initial orientation or our initial angle. And if we wanted to know what our final orientation would be, we would simply take our initial orientation and add to that our change in orientation. Now let's go ahead and let's take a look at this angular displacement in action. And for illustrative purposes, we are going to use a wheel. And I want you to be following the red dot on this wheel as we go through this example. That is going to represent, at this point, my positive x-axis. So we are going to say that this is going to be an orientation of zero. Now I am going to displace in a counterclockwise direction to orientation A. And you can see here my first displacement is going to be from x to position A. Then I'm going to have another displacement to position B. So I have another rotation that goes from A to B. And then finally, I'm going to have a rotation all the way over to position C. And again, I can have a vector, once again represented by that curved arrow, that goes from position B to position C. And in this particular case, if I was looking at those series of successive rotations, my final angular displacement would simply go from x to c. And in this case, I can say that my angular displacement and the angular distances were the same. Now let's go ahead and let's take a look at another example. Again, I'm going to start at the x position, which we say would be our neutral or starting position. I'm going to first rotate to position a. And you can see my first rotation here goes from x to a. My second rotation is going to go from A to B, and you can see that that is going to be depicted from A to B. Now, unlike the first example, we are going to change directions. We are going to rotate from B to C, but now instead of going in the counterclockwise direction, we're going to go in the clockwise direction to position C. So in this case, you can see now my vector goes in the clockwise direction from B to C. And it's also important to realize here that if I were just to look at my total angular displacement, it would go from X to C. And in this case, we can see that there is a difference between my angular distance and my angular displacement. And that's because I changed directions from my initial starting position to my final starting position. Now let's talk about velocity. Remember, velocity was how fast you were going in a particular direction. And we said mathematically, it was the displacement divided by the change in time, or my change in position divided by the change in time. And I can manipulate this equation around so I can determine what my final displacement was by taking the velocity and multiplying it by the change in time. Additionally, I can swap variables on the left and right sides, and I can say that my change in time is going to be determined by my change in position, or my displacement, divided by my velocity. 
Conceptually, angular velocity, which is denoted by the Greek letter omega, is going to be the same. And that we can say that our angular velocity, or omega, is equal to our change in orientation, or our change in angle, or our delta theta, divided by that change in time. And if I wanted to know what my final displacement would be, I would simply multiply that angular velocity by my change in time, and I will get my final angular displacement. Or we can swap variables on the left and right hand sides, and we can say that the change in time is going to be equal to my angular displacement divided by my angular velocity. Linear acceleration was how quickly our velocity was changing in a particular direction. Mathematically, we said that, that was going to be equal to the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And once again, we can manipulate the variables within the equation, and we can see what our change in velocity is going to be. Our change in velocity is going to be equal to our acceleration multiplied by our change in time. Now let's look at angular acceleration denoted by the Greek letter alpha. Our angular acceleration is how quickly our rotation is changing. And we can mathematically depict our angular acceleration as being equal to the change in angular velocity divided by the change in time. And once again, if we want to know what our final change in velocity is going to be, we would simply take that angular acceleration, multiply it by the change in time, and we'd get our change in our angular velocity. So now let's go ahead and let's look at these representations with vectors. And again, we're going to use that wheel as an example because I'm assuming that it's going to be well known to you. And let's take that wheel, and again, keep your eye on that red dot, and we'll look at how that wheel is rotating. And again, we are going to depict that with an angular vector. Now, at another point in time, that wheel is going to end up speeding up. And again, we can depict that with another vector. Recall that that prime symbol after the angular velocity abbreviation is going to mean that it's going to be at another point in time. And the fact that it's depicted by a longer arrow means that it's going to be a larger magnitude. That means that from our initial time to our final time, we sped up. And just like our linear quantities, if we have an increase in velocity, that means we had to have had an acceleration. And specifically, we had to have had an acceleration that was in the direction of travel. So our process box in the center is going to show exactly that. And that if we are going to have an increase in our angular velocity, we have to have an angular acceleration as well as a change of time. But that angular acceleration has to be in the direction of travel. In this case, counterclockwise. Now let's look at another scenario. We're going to have that wheel, and it's going to be going at a certain angular velocity. And again, that's going to be depicted by our vector. Now at another point in time, we are going to be going slower than what we were going at before. That will be depicted, again, with a prime symbol, as well as a shorter vector. And just like our linear quantities, if we've had a change in velocity, we've had to have an acceleration. And if we are slowing down, we had to have had an acceleration that was opposite of the direction of travel. So our process box in the center would be represented by an acceleration vector that would be going opposite of the direction of travel, in this case, in the clockwise direction. Now, one thing that we will discuss in class is I'm going to ask you to draw an angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration curve from zero degrees of elbow flexion to 90 degrees of elbow flexion. And for this exercise, I want you to assume that elbow flexion is going to occur in the negative direction. We'll see how you do, and we'll talk about that in class. Finally, I just want to mention something about angular jerk, 
angular jerk is going to be how quickly our angular acceleration is changing. And that angular jerk is going to be equal to the change in acceleration divided by the change in time. So those are our kinematic variables for angular kinematics. Next up, we'll be looking at how we change those angular variables into linear ones.